Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. If you're not, well, you know I wasn't here last week. I was out of town, and I want to thank Tony Johnson for preaching an awesome message. Very good message. Talented preacher. But here's the thing. There's a but. <laughs> so Tony said something in his message that was not true. Oh, no. And I have to correct it. I don't normally do. Now, I'm not going to say it was heresy, but it was wrong. All right? So he said that I was better than him. That is not true. Tony's awesome in his own way. We're just different. Indeed, if someone came up to you and said, what's your pastor like? You might say, well, he's different, right? So that's totally true. All right, so it is different here. We like to talk about what Jesus liked to talk about, and that includes death, right? So as Christians, uh, we shouldn't be afraid of death, right? We know that heaven's a better place than here. Yes, amen to that. So that's what happens when we die. So we can have a little fun talking about death, right? It doesn't have a sting over us. So today we're going to talk about very famous last words, very famous last words. So I figure I'd break the ice a little bit by giving you guys some funny last words that people, real people actually have said, either on their deathbeds or right before they die, right? So let's talk about death like this. So <laughs> Lawrence of Rome. So back in the day, there's a lot of persecution in the church, about 258 AD in Rome. He's a saint. Lawrence of Rome, he's a deacon. <laughs> he's on his deathbed, and he says, turn me over. I'm done on this side, right? So the patron saint of cooks, speaking of cooking, there's this guy, James French was his name. He was a murderer. He's about to get the chair. He's about to get executed, electri electrified. Is that what they're... Right? So he says this. These were his last words. Hey, fellas, how about this for a headline for tomorrow's paper? French fries. Somebody knew that one. <laughs> that was a good one. Okay. <laughs> John Sedgwick. He's a commander general in the Union Army during the Civil War. All right? So he's on the battlefield and he says, they couldn't hit an elephant at this dist... <laughs> Not an elephant, but a general. Uh, W.C. Fields. Deathbed. I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> Bob Hope, surprise me. Ah, so he even found the humor in that, right, on his deathbed. Well, as Christians, we don't have to be surprised, right? We know what's to come, and we can celebrate it. As Paul said, I'd rather just go home and be with the Lord, but for your sakes, I'll just stick around. Now, I'm going to be careful about that, because the last time I was up here and I prayed that the Lord would just take me, I had grown adults coming up to me afterwards, like, don't leave us yet, Pastor. I'm like, really? Did you get anything I talked about? It's okay. I know you love me. I love you too, but... I'd rather just go home and be with the Lord as much as I love you. That's just it. Again, especially before this election cycle. So here we go. <laughs> as Christians, we don't have to be. So, yeah, that's not a joke. So anyway, it's funny. but Okay, we're in the rest of the story. So Tony's message, Armor of God, Ephesians uh, 6. So I'll try to kind of bring it together a little bit here. But we're going to continue faithfully in the rest of the story. Uh, if you're new here, this is kind of what it's all about, and it's really kind of crazy that we have to build this culture here of, like, learning to read the entire story, right, <laughs> before we draw a conclusion. And that's what's happening. So that's what the rest of the story uh, was really birthed from, is just this idea, like, let's build a culture where we actually honor God's word. As Christians, imagine that. So it's not like one verse and then, you know, me talking about my dog or opinions and stuff like that. I can talk a little bit about pizza that happens, but for the most part, it's mostly God's word. And when you really think about it, it's crazy that it's usually not. So that's what's going on. And with that is reading the Bible. It's a spiritual book. We're supposed to read it, right, by the power of the Holy Spirit. But it's like any other book where we're supposed to just, like, actually read it straight through. So if we sat down with one of our favorite books, what might we do? We'd sit down, maybe read, I don't know, you know, 10 pages, 20 pages. Some people can read a book in an afternoon, all right? Now, you're not going to read all this in an afternoon unless you, like, I don't know what you'd have to do. But you could read, like, Genesis, right? So today I read the book of Genesis, but you never hear that. You hear people, like, posting, talking about the verse of the day. While that's well-intentioned, 
It's not the way you should read a book, right? So imagine that, just reading a sentence of a book randomly all over the place. You just never know what it's about. And that's why most people, Christians included, do not know what the Bible is about. So kind of sad. So we're doing this in the series. Uh, where we left off, <clears throat> we did a larger section. And again, we dispelled a lot of false teachings just with the text alone. It's amazing how you can do that, right? I see people argue, and you're not supposed to be doing that as Christians anyway, but whatever. They're debating all these things, and they're plucking a verse here, plucking a verse there. I mean, really, honestly, if I had to debate, and I just really wouldn't because I don't have the time for that nonsense, but I would just sit there and just start reading the Bible. It's all you really need to do, and we're seeing in this series, like, wow, Jesus totally corrects that if we just keep, like, listening to him. And we learn that in Matthew 5 through 7, right? That's the Sermon on the Mount. Three chapters. It's a sermon. And we saw that if you stop at Matthew chapter 5, you miss some stuff because he clarifies in chapter 6 and clarifies in chapter 7. So we got that out of John 14 through 17. So he had some predictions. The Holy Spirit was one of them. His death was another one of them. He's leaving this world in his physical body. He's preparing the disciples. He prays for the disciples, and he prays for us, too. That was pretty cool. We saw that. Um, so that's what we're going to look at. We're going to continue from there. Now, if you're not new here, you may not know the Bible's not in chronological order. So you have the four Gospels. We're in the Gospels. They give us slightly different perspectives here and there, and they're not in chronological order. So I make charts for you guys um, that like probably two people look at. But anyway, it's there for you in the app. We did have some technical difficulties with the website. They're sorting it out now. I'm pretty sure this made it to the app, but if it didn't remain calm, it'll get there, okay? So let's just calm down. So we ended in a prayer, Jesus' prayer. Now Jesus is going to pray. In John, it's really short. That's where we were. It just doesn't really mention that. It just jumps right into the other stuff. But in Luke, it gives us a few other details. And so that's where I want to pick up right now. All right, so remember that Jesus, upper room, praying for his disciples. So Luke 22, 39, then accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. At last, he stood up again and returned to the disciples, only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. All right. Uh, the spirit is strong, but the flesh is weak. So a few things to explain here. Um, horrified and distressed, it says in Mark. It's a pretty good translation of the Greek. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've done this before, both sides of the coin in fear. Jesus is tremendously anxious here. So the idea is, and he says, don't be anxious about anything. Well, Jesus, why are you anxious? That's the ideal. Right? That's what we're shooting for, but we are human beings, and so that happens. And here, it happens to the extent that Jesus sweats blood. I'm going to butcher this word here. Hematidrosis. If you're a doctor, forgive me. All right, so that is a medical condition where you would get so anxious that you sweat blood. I've never been that anxious where that happened to me. The blood vessels around the sweat glands, they constrict, and that's what happens under extreme stress, extreme anxiety. Yet, your will be done, Father, just like we say. So now Jesus is going to get betrayed and arrested. We'll hop to John. John 18, 3. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now, with blazing torches and lanterns and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for, he asked. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am, he says, or I am he, just so you understand it. Jesus said, Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am, or I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. Once more, he asked them, who are you looking for? And again, they replied, Jesus the Nazarene. I told you that I am he, Jesus said. And since I am the one you want, let these others go. He did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? Now, there are a few things here. We kind of want to go over 
Uh, tying to the message. First of all, the, the I am thing, if you've been in the series, if you've been with us for a while, you know this is the burning bush, right? So Exodus 3, I think around verse 14. Like, what do I call you, Lord, Moses asked. I am. Tell them that I am sent you. So when Jesus is doing this, he's saying he's God. I am. And here you can see the words, they have power. They knock everybody over. Now, here's the other thing about the sword. Uh, I want to take a step back in Luke. We'll go take a step back in Luke. I kind of hopped over it and I did it intentionally and saved it for right here so that you could see these two things together. Because what I'm about to show you, a lot of people will take it and pluck it out of the context, right? Just those few verses, uh -uh, and they won't like finish, finish, <laughs> and like get what it's all about. So I want to take you to the verses that people misuse. So if we take just a step back from where we started today, remember that uh, Peter's fervently saying, like, I'm not going to deny you, right? So, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you, even to die with you. But Jesus says, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. All right? When Jesus, uh, then he asked him, listen, when I sent you out to preach the good news, like the first time, <clears throat> you did not have any money, a traveler's bag, or an extra pair of sandals. Did you? Did you need anything? No, they replied. We didn't need anything. But now, take your money in a traveler's bag, and if you don't have a sword... Sell your cloak and buy one, for the time has come for this prophecy about me to be fulfilled. He was counted among the rebels. Yes, everything written about me by the prophets will come true. So buy a sword. So here's what happens. <laughs> they say, look, Lord, we have two swords. Now, the next thing Jesus says is important and sometimes confused. Most likely it's, it's enough, right? Stop it. Like you're not, have you been listening this whole time <laughs> to anything I'm saying? Right? Also, when he sent them, what did he tell them? Right? When you're persecuted in one town, flee to the next. He didn't say, get a sword, chop up the people who persecuted. He'd never say that. So most likely, the proper translation is, it's enough. Like, duh, you know, you're not getting this. Or, if it really is, that's enough. Do you think Jesus is that bad at math? All right, they're nine swords short. Judas has left them, right? <laughs> Two swords, it's not enough. Jesus isn't bad at math. So, Here's what's going on here. If you also remember, remember, Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And he was talking about, like, parents, I will divide, you know, families will be divided over me. Did he mean cut your dad's head off? Say no. Please, please say no. I mean, it just gets really frustrating something. Right? Please say no. No! Right? No. You know, it means just to divide. Right? It's a figurative sword. Same here. He's saying be ready. All right? Now, jump forward. Right? What does he say to Peter? He chops off Malchus's ear. Right? John tells on him. It's the only place you find the names of the people. It's the Gospel of John. It's kind of funny. Chops off his ear. Jesus says, ah, put away the sword. And then what does he do? He heals his ear. Do not. If we keep reading, we go to Matthew. Matthew 26, 50. So Judas is going to come to betray him. Judas is kissed. Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus, Peter, <laughs> pulled out his sword and struck the high priest, slave, high priest slave, slashing off his ear. Pay attention. Put away your sword, Jesus told him. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he would send them instantly? <laughs> Jesus' followers don't need Swords, right? So we have the sword of the Spirit. That's the sword we need. It's not a regular sword. Jesus tells them not to use swords. Also, if you keep reading, <laughs> you'll know what I know. In Acts, there's no instance of them ever retaliating with any kind of violence. And James of James and John is killed by the sword. What do they do? Retaliate? No. <laughs> they go to prison. They die. Whatever. Be like Jesus, okay? So just to clear that up, if anyone ever, you see that line used, you're like, you don't know your Bible. <laughs> it's out of context. So just to clear that up, and it'll tie into what we're talking about. So now Jesus gets put on trial, and here's what I want to acknowledge. It's going to seem uh, like I'm going through this really fast, and it's not to dishonor this whole section or anything like that. It's that just before Easter, uh, before the Good Friday, uh, before Good Friday, that Sunday, I went through this at length in great detail. I want to focus on Jesus' last words from the cross. So I'm not going through quickly just to say don't pay attention to this. It's just you can read it on your own. You can go back, watch that message. You should just read it on your own, really. I just want to summarize this to talk about that section, just so you know what I'm doing here. So 
he gets bounced around a lot. A lot of people don't understand. You really have to kind of like look at all the gospel accounts at once and see what's going on. But he goes to Annas. Then he goes to Caiaphas, who's the actual high priest. So he's bounced around on all these little trials. He's questioned again and again and again. Uh, amidst that, and you can put up the chart like just to kind of see, uh, this is chronological-ish, right? So some scholars will be like, yeah, perfect, and then others will be like, no, you're wrong. So it, it's kind of difficult to do. Uh, but amidst this, you have to read it and kind of like flash through scenes like you're watching some TV show with like three things going on at once. So Peter's denying him, and he'll get through his three denials in the course of these trials. Uh, but what's important, he finally gets uh, put before the council in the morning. Then they take him to Pilate, Pontius Pilate, right? Pontius Pilate doesn't want anything to do with him, doesn't know what to do. He sends him to Herod. Herod's like the tetrarch, like the king of the Jewish people of that time. He's like a client king is what they would call him. He gets actually mocked there, and there's like a purple robe scene there too. Then he gets sent back to Pilate. Again, Pilate doesn't want anything to do with him. His wife's like, eh, you know, she has a dream and everything. So this whole thing there is a dialogue with Jesus, the longest in John. That's the longest dialogue we get between Pilate and Jesus. And then you know the scene, right? He wants to kind of give him a shot to get off the hook. So you have Jesus or Barabbas, but they're like, crucify him, crucify him. Fine. So then it sends this into motion. And what we have here uh, is Jesus flogged. Now, this is just a really small, it's a short section. It just kind of says that he was flogged, right? With a lead tip whip, uh, if you read it. And you can kind of like be tempted to go pass over too quickly, but just stop. So you can put the picture up. I just want to explain something to you if you didn't already know. It's worse than that. It's really, really, really bad. Uh, I, I gore would, would be the actual thing. Some scholars say that he's whipped so badly that you could see his organs. Now, if you've ever gotten a tattoo on your back or seen someone do that, it's painful. Why? Because I'm not saying you should do that, right? <laughs> but obviously I've made mistakes. But So anyway, it, it, you're, all your nerves are there. All your nerves come right out of the spine there. And so this is just extremely painful. I got really bad sunburn on my back once. It was debilitating. Like I couldn't even move. So now imagine having your back like filleted, whipped open. All right? So it's crazy. It's like a lead tip whip. They say some of these whips would have like sheep bones and stuff in it so that it would not just like whip and then cause it to tear. It would be tearing at your back. So this is where Jesus is at here in these couple sentences in the Bible. It's... it's insane. Um, then, <clears throat> insult to injury, he's mocked. So the Roman soldiers are going to play with him a little bit. They, they're like, you're a king, right? They put a crown of thorns on his head. So now, you know, if you know anything about, like, head injuries, I know a lot about head injuries, unfortunately, from fighting. Uh, anything, like, you cut above the eyebrows bleeds like crazy. It just bleeds a lot. It's hard. That's what a lot of fighters do. They try to, like Muay Thai, they elbow you here. Why? To get you to bleed because they can't stop the cut. That's why I have a cut man. Can't stop the cut. They stop the fight. That's it. You can't see. So he's bleeding profusely. Like his blood is coming out from everything. It's crazy. All right, so hit him with a reed stick. And they mock him purple robe. And they're mocking Jesus, spitting on him. Now uh, he's dead. Like this guy's going to die. That's it. No human being. And he's in a human form. He's God. He's going to die. That's it. All right, so they have him carry a cross beam, probably the beam. <laughs> How do you do that? Of course, he falls, right? So Simon of Cyrene, father of Alexander and Rufus, we'll talk about Rufus and Rome, uh, Romans 16, he appears. So anyway, <clears throat> but anyway, he helps him carry the cross. You're, you're just looking at a dead man at this point. They crucify him. So you can put that up. Um, nailed to the cross is interesting because if you're just reading it, you're like, wait a minute. It doesn't say that unless you're like reading and we'll look at it in easy reading version. You kind of, another example of like, keep reading, read the whole text because in John 20, you know that Thomas says, ah, I, I want to see the nail wounds in his wrist. So Greek word for wrist and hand are the same in biblical Greek. Like a keri is like for hand or wrist. It can be either one. Uh, so probably here, people debate too much about that. He gets nailed to the cross, um, which is horrific. Uh, if you put him through here, you're going to bleed out. Like that's it. Right? You're going to hit the vein or artery or whatever there. It's horrific. Nailing the feet. This is too pretty. Uh, they've excavated certain uh, sites, and they found Jewish prisoners crucified. The nail probably went through both heels. Now, if you know anything about crucifixion, it's that you're going to suffocate. That's what's going to happen to you. If you hang by your arms for a long time, like 
your diaphragm, you can't do what you got to do with your diaphragm. And it takes a long time. It might take like a day or two, but eventually you just, you won't have the strength to pull yourself back up or you know, get that air that you need. Well, think about it. You know, if you, you do this, take a deep breath. Don't do it now. Stay seated. Take a deep breath. Yeah, I met you. <laughs> take a deep breath, right? But now, don't do it now. Turn to your side and try to take that same deep breath. It ain't happening the same way. So if you're like this, yeah, not just uncomfortable, but you can't get your diaphragm to move, to move the way it should move. Um, but here's the thing. He's bleeding out. And <clears throat> Think about it. It's just unimaginable that you would have nails going through your wrists, your hands, your heels, right? That's enough. That's enough. But now, in order to breathe, you have to pull yourself up against those nails or push against that nail that's going through your heels. And your back's cut wide open and you're rubbing it against the tree. So it's six hours of, uh, of crucifixion there. So some people will say three, they're bad at math and they don't know how to read. <laughs> it's, it's six. So it's from nine to three in our way of thinking of time. And, Spoiler alert, Pilate's surprised when they ask for his body, Joseph of Arimathea, because, again, it usually takes a long time, but he's just lost so much blood. It, it, that's it. He lasts six hours. Um, so just, just on that, I can't, like, think too deeply about it because it makes me weep. It's just, what? You know, uh, to a normal person, this is unimaginable to witness something like this, but my Lord? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. So amidst this, He's being ridiculed, and all these things are happening to him. And so this is what I want to focus. Like In this state, Jesus is dying. He knows he is. What does he say? What comes out of his mouth? Luke 23, 32. Two others, both criminals, were led to be executed with him. When they came to the place called the skull, they nailed him. Now, the easy reader will just say nailed because that is what happens, but just says crucified in the Greek. To a cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. <laughs> what? So I meet with people all the time. They have problems. Right? They have problems. And one of the problems a lot of people have is they just can't seem to forgive somebody who like owes them a hundred bucks. This can't seem to do it. How long have you been struggling with this? Years, years. You know, and it just, it takes all of me not to like just put that bit here. <laughs> you know what he said? Forgive them. That's what he said. Seriously? Now it's not uncommon. If you have problems forgiving someone, I'll talk about it a little later, it's a problem. But it's not uncommon. You're not alone. But really? Forgive them immediately. Luke 23, 39, one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then, Jesus, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Really? This guy is sentenced, he's a criminal robber, right? But he's sentenced to die. Jesus forgives it for believing in him. Wow. Twice now. He's forgiving people that probably don't deserve it. John and Mary, John 19, 25, standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there besides the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here's your son. And he said to the disciple, Here's your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. He's concerned about everybody else. I don't know about you, right? But like when I get hurt real bad... I don't think about anybody but myself. We go into like protection mode, right? We start worrying about ourselves. This is beyond emergency mode. This is crazy. And he's like arranging affairs from the cross. Like, don't you think 
like he knows his mom would be fine? Again, six hours of crucifixion, and then you get the death of Jesus. And so here's this other three hours uh, going on. Matthew 27, 45, at noon, darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. At about 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? John 19, 28, Jesus knew that his mission was now finished, and to fulfill scripture, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put it on a hyssop branch and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit, Luke 23, 44. By this time, it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land. Going back to Matthew there. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down in the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathes his last. Now, we won't have the time to get into all the deep theology there and the tie-ins to the Old Testament, the hyssop branch and everything. I just want to focus on the application, but we can go over to Bible study. That's fine. Let's just stay in this moment. These, these are some powerful last words. Powerful. And there's just, I could just talk all day about their meaning. Powerful. And indeed, these words have power. And it just kind of makes me reflect, you know, how perfect Jesus is. And it makes me think, like, have you ever said something that you wished you could take back? I think that's all of us, right? They've said that words are like toothpaste. Right? Once they're out, you can't get them back in the tube. That's it. Now, many will try, but why engage in such a messy, futile effort when we can just avoid it in the first place? Now, maybe you were able to apologize, but here's the thing. Just think about it this way. Twist thinking a tiny bit. Or turn it around. I shouldn't say twist. What if it becomes too late? What if those words were your last words to that person? It's interesting. It's something I probably picked up from my grandparents or somewhere along the line. Somebody in my family once said, like, notice as a kid, like, whenever they would part company, they would always, like, give each other a hug and kiss. And they argued a lot, but it would all get dropped, like, in that moment. If they were going to, like, leave the house or part company, and they'd say, I love you. Always. Like, always. And to this day, my wife leaves the house, my daughter leaves the house, I love you. And it doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter. We could be fighting, arguing, whatever it is, disagreeing. Because the thinking is, if this is the last thing, this is what I want her to remember. If it's the last thing I say to her, I want her to know that. It doesn't matter what happened. It doesn't matter. I love you. It doesn't, it's not going to change that. That's important. If you don't do that, think about it. You know, it's anything can, tomorrow is not guaranteed. I don't know. So I love you. It's the last thing out of my mouth I want her to hear. Those are going to be my last words, if they're mine or if they're the last words she hears. Because words have power. It's not about these arguments. We need to settle differences because in that process, in the process of getting the last word in, we have to remember that those words or that word might be the last they ever hear. We don't often think about how close we are to our last words. So the scriptures challenge us, right? Will our last words to a person or our own, will they follow the pattern of Christ? Will they be like his? Will they be caring? Like Jesus cared for his mom. Will they be caring words? Will they be selfless in that way? Will we have forgiven others, even if they don't deserve it, like the thief or the people crucifying Jesus, gambling for his clothes? Will we forgive them? Think about it. What he's going through, the suffering and mockery, and he forgives them. Will we do that without an excuse? But, right, I 
I'm going to forgive the but. I'm really struggling with this. Well, and here's the thing. I, <laughs> to be real with you, there are some very serious consequences. A lot of you know the Lord's Prayer, right? And how do you end it? Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever and ever, right? Jesus never said that. You know, that's not a part of the Lord's Prayer. No, it's a great thing to say because it's true. But if you go to Matthew 6, that's not there. You know what is there? If you forgive others, your Father will forgive you. If you don't, your Father in heaven will not forgive your sins. That's how it really ends. 6, verses 14 and 15. That's what's immediately following. But strangely, we've taken it out. Why do you think that is? And we just added something else, doxology. Huh. Open your Bible and read it. Kind of funny. So it's scary too, isn't it? If you don't forgive others, your father... Now, there's some hyperbole in the Lord's Prayer, right? Like plucking your eyes out. From everything I know about the Word of God, I don't think that's hyperbole. I think he means it. Because he says it at other times. And we looked at that in the series. It's interesting. So here's the thing, and I, I just want to share this with you from my perspective. When I'm with someone who's dying, and they're going to be saying their last words, two things are primary for me. I'm racing to these two things. First thing, do you know Jesus? Is he your Lord and your Savior? Do you really believe that? Is he your Lord and your Savior? Because without that, you ain't getting in. That's it. Like, you don't have time. Like, okay, do I need to? And then whatever I need to do, depending on where the person's at, right? Share the gospel. Like, you really, that this is all you need. Next part is equally as important because of what Jesus says. Who do you need to forgive? It's the next thing I say. That's what I go to. Who do you need to forgive? Because if you believe what Jesus is saying, if you have lack of forgiveness in your heart, you are not getting in. Your Father will not forgive your sins. And I want you to read it. I'm not even going to read it to you. I'm not going to put it up on the screen. You open your Bible and read. Read the whole Sermon on the Mount, please. It's three chapters. You won't die. Maybe you will. I don't know. <laughs> but it would be a good thing to read right before you die. Get to chapter 6, and I believe it's right around 14 and 15. Read those words. It's important. Do we believe, like Jesus, that <clears throat> we're going to go to the Father, that we're going to go to heaven? Are we ready to commit our spirit, our soul, into God's hands and thereby forsake the world? Jesus says, was it a prophet of man to gain the whole world but lose your soul? Are we ready? Do we really believe? We have faith, real faith. Do we believe that we're going to heaven? Do we believe this whole thing? Here's the thing. Jesus didn't die so that we could win arguments. That's not why. So that we could hurt each other with our words. So that we could sin. That wasn't the purpose here. He died for our sins, but not so that we could sin. He didn't take insult injury so that we could turn around and insult and injure others. That wasn't the point. It's not why. He didn't die so we could have the last word. He is the last word. So this happens, right? So th Jesus tells them how many times? I don't know. So many times. This is going to happen to you too. You know, when he's saying, <laughs> was it profit of man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? You know what else he says right in that section? If you want to be my follower, you need to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. That's the context. Because Peter's saying, what? No, Lord, this won't happen to you because you just told him he's going <laughs> to suffer and die. That's the whole point. Okay. So they might not get it, right, because the sword thing. But then they do, and we see in Acts, they start to get it. Oh, okay, you know, and they accept the persecution. They even count it as joy that they were beaten, by <laughs> the Jewish religious leader, that we got to suffer for Jesus. Yes! Read Acts. It's amazing. It turns around. They get it. They see what Jesus goes through. And now, so 
Later in the Bible, you get letters like First and Second Peter. They're written primarily because they're suffering. First and Second Thessalonians is like this too. They're suffering persecution. They're, they're suffering. People are putting them in jail, beating them. Uh, in the context of First Peter, setting them on fire. Uh, emperors around that time, like Nero, like to do that for fun to Christians. Right? Just let's just set them on fire and watch them run around, make candles out of them. That's what's going on here to Christians. So First Peter is written. And let me dive in here. So speaking of Jesus' sacrifice, this is the mindset he wants you to be in. 1 Peter 1.18. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. It was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. He continues, 1 Peter 1.22. <clears throat> you were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. So you see the response that he's calling for? Jesus died for you, accepted this insult. Oh, your response should be just loving everybody. Get to the second chapter, 1 Peter 2.1. So get rid. So, so what? Jesus died for you, right? Love one another. So... Get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. All unkind speech. Be done with that. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. What do you think that means? Cry out for this nourishment now that you've had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Return it. So if he continues, he talks about being living stones for God's house. We've talked about this again in this series, temporary residence. We're just passing through. This is not our permanent home. Another theme here, right? So we're just passing through. So he says this, it is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. Wait, what? What should silence them? Our words back. Nope. Our actions. For you're free, yet you're God's slave. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. 1 Peter 2.17, respect everyone and love the family of believers. Fear God and respect the king. What? But wait, he's burning our families alive. Uh huh. Respect him. Did you see what Jesus did? And this is a letter not to like a specific church leader. This is a letter to all Christians. You, me. Doesn't matter how you're being treated. Respect and honor them. What? 1 Peter 2.21, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned nor deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted nor threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. He is our example. We must follow in his steps. He carried our sins on the cross so we could be dead to those sins. And that includes retaliation, anger, insult. Those are all sins. Arguing, being argumentative or divisive. So if we go to Galatians 5, that's the flesh being divisive. He took our place and gave us freedom not to sin, but to return the love. That's the point. Now, here's the thing. We often retaliate. Why do we retaliate? Why do we do that? Because we think we know everything. That's why that other person must be wrong. It's so like the gospel, that's a hill you want to die on. All right? It's great. But how many times have you changed your position about certain things? Or, you know, as you get older, you think differently about certain things, right? 
So it's good to listen. Two ears, one mouth, for a good reason. Listen. Listen. I don't know. I want to hear it out. Right? Jesus isn't God. La, 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 I'm not listening. Okay, that's when I'm going to do that. But other things, I will listen, even within doctrine and theology. It's whatever. Okay. But we retaliate because we think we know everything. Right? You think you know everything. It's amazing. You know, it's, it doesn't, it's not just politics. I think of that. That comes to mind. But you think you know everything. You know, and then you meet someone, <laughs> like my friend Ed, right? And he's worked in Washington for many, many years. And, you know, like we, like we said from the scriptures, right? They're all liars, right? You know, you realize is that. When you get to see what's going on behind the scenes, you're like, oh, I didn't know that. So be careful. In the Bible, you'll see. It tells us, don't think you know it all. Careful. Be very careful. A lot of people are being played. And so, but the problem is we don't believe that, right? I can't be played. I can't be deceived. I can't, I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. And then we're on this mission to prove to everyone, I'm right. My position is right. You need to hear my position because it's the only right one. Nobody else is right but me or anyone who believes in me and votes the same way. Okay. But let me tell you something. That's not a Christian attitude. The gospel's above all that garbage. I almost said a bad word. Ooh. And as a former New Yorker, I worry about that every time I preach. <laughs> like, woo <-hoo. laughs> Close. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit. So, <laughs> get me riled up. But anyway, sorry. It's just, we're sharing. We're sharing. It's okay. Right. The gospel, it's above all that other nonsense. It's all noise. Like, blah, blah, blah. I'm doing everything I do to get to the gospel. I will do anything especially make you pizza. So like, the, right? So and I'll use anything. I want to get you to the gospel. It's fine. You know what I mean? I'll dress however you want me to dress, whatever. I'll say I like fishing, like whatever. I'll go fishing with you. Camping. You know what I mean? Things I don't like doing. I'll just do them all the time. But that's what you're supposed to do, right? You know, you're supposed to meet people where they are. Okay, fine. You know what I mean? I'll try. And then let's just talk about Jesus. Like everything just needs to get to Jesus. So here's the thing. They had the pro this problem in the early church too. And I'm just going to kind of paraphrase Romans uh, for you um, because this is what it's about. And then, then we'll close and you can eat pizza. Ha. So here's the thing. <laughs> let's, let's, let's dive in though and not lose our concentration. I'm preaching to myself. The pizza second. almost smell it. So, <laughs> so Romans. They had this problem in the early church too. And this is what Romans is all about. Ephesians is about this too. Uh, so people begin thinking they know everything, and they develop these superiority complexes. Right? So the first problem is found in Acts. Uh, you get the Jews, so if you don't understand, I'm just going to make this as short as I can. Basically, Christianity is not Christianity yet, so you get to like Acts 11, verse 27, I think. But they're not called Christians. It's like the sect of the Nazarenes, right? Jesus of Nazareth. So it's a Jewish sect. You pretty much need to be Jewish to kind of get in. You don't see too many Gentile believers until Acts 10, and Peter gets it. He's like, oh the Gentiles kind of come in too. So it's a Jewish faith, right? So you have your first churches being built, and they're being built by well, Jewish people, right, that converted to Christianity, to think of it like Messianic Jew, like that kind of thing. So they're developing. If you get to Acts 18, you see Priscilla and Aquila come from Rome. Why? Because Claudius, the emperor at the time, expelled the Jews from Rome, kicked them out. That's it, get out. But eventually, I think ironically by Nero, they get let back into Rome. But what was happening in the meantime? Well, the churches were still going, but who was running them? Gentiles. Right? These are people who are not Jews. Right? So just, just for the sake of argument, this is not completely correct. But you need to think of Judaism, especially in this period, it's like an ethno-religion. Right? So it's like a religion and an ethnicity as well. Right? So they're like, we're God's chosen people, which isn't entirely wrong. And Paul will also talk about that. So think of it. They're having these uh, religious and ethnic divisions in the church. Right? So it's like racism. Think of it kind of like that. Right? I'm better than you. So they're butting heads, and Paul doesn't like it. Right? God doesn't like it. So this is why Romans is written. He didn't sit down, and it's a great theological work. But he didn't sit down and go, ah, let me blow their minds right now with some great theology. No, he's trying to get them to get along. And so you need to sit down and read all of Romans at once. And you'll get this picture. So I'm, I'm paraphrasing using many translations. Okay, just understand that. It's not perfect. But this is, I want you to just see what Romans is all about on a topic, and then we'll finish with some scriptures instead of me. What's going on is chapter 1. He starts off the letter. No, just 
Anything you read in Romans, keep that context in mind. You're dealing with Jews and Gentiles. Just, just imagine like two different races or two different religions doing this. Everything you read in Romans, just apply that, apply that, apply that. Every verse you read, that has to be on your mind. It has to. That, that's how you get Romans right. One, the Gentiles have sinned. That's chapter one, one, basic point, right? Two, the Jews have sinned. If you know so much, because they're superior, they have the law. You know, teach yourself. So remember, they have the law. And so when he's talking about the law, this is why. You know so much, teach yourself, right? Chapter three, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Chapter four, he goes back to the law and uses Abraham as an example of faith, right? So he had faith before he was circumcised, before the law of Moses. That's why he's talking about Abraham there, right? So he's back to the Jewish people. It's kind of like this back and forth to the boy. He's like, you know, reprimanding both groups, right? So four, five through seven, Adam and Christ contrasted. So he's getting the whole point here. The, 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 the new Adam, right? It's Christ, right? So this is Adam's Christ. The law in chapter five, so he starts there. Chapter six, you're not slaves to sin. Chapter seven, if anyone says to you, that's about Paul struggling with sin, stop listening to them. They don't know what they're talking about. It's called possible PC. It's a literary device in which Paul is mocking Adam. He can't be struggling with sin because he just said in chapter six, we are not slaves to sin. You're in trouble. Should we keep on sinning so that grace may abound? May it never be. That's how he starts chapter six, <laughs> right? They don't understand. Chapter seven, not strange thing. He's mocking Adam. Why? We have new Christ. Then in chapter eight, if you didn't get it, he says we have a new life by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not dead in our sin anymore. We're done. And here's the thing I want to get to. Nine through 11. Now, nine through 11. This, that's, that's the section where this comes to mind. So Paul's like, wait a minute, what about all the Jewish people who don't believe in Jesus? What's going to happen to them? So when you read 9 through 11, that has to be on your mind, the division. And what's going to happen to the Jews that don't accept Jesus? Well, <laughs> Paul says, right, like paraphrase, instead of seeing these people go to hell, right, that's the point, I would rather be cursed and be separated from Christ. Now, that's got to be hyperbole. Right? You can't mean that, but the point there, and the word is anathema. And cursed isn't good enough. In Greek way of thinking, it's more like saying a bad word in church. Like, oh, it's, a, it's like damned. I'd rather be damned than see all these people lost. And so what Paul's like basically bouncing around, he gives some beautiful illustrations like the olive tree. And here's, you got to know, remember this, the butting of the heads is going on. So he's kind of like going back and forth to both the groups. And so what he's saying is his point is that there must be, so they're God's elect people, they're God's chosen people, there must be hope for them. Like that, that's Paul's heart. That's what his heart is saying here. Right? He gives this illustration back to the Gentiles. Like, you know, hey, look, you know, and don't gloat over this situation that the Jews are in. Like if you, a wild olive branch, were grafted into the natural tree, right? Yeah, some of those branches fell off, but how much easier will they be grafted in? That's the point. So think, I want you to think about this, and if you've been in church for a while and you've heard the theology that people usually go to in there, think about what's going on, think about what Paul's saying here. What is Paul saying? Right? No division in the church, you guys are all one, get along. Also, even the Jews who didn't believe, think about it if you've read Acts, what do they do to Paul? They stone him, they try to kill him, they're chasing, basically the whole end of the book of Acts, they're chasing him around right? Trying to get him thrown in prison, killed. What does Paul do? He's acting like Jesus. Forgive them. Lord, I hope they get in. That's the point in those chapters. He hopes they get in. And Gentiles, you know what? They're just using you to make them jealous so that they get in. <laughs> okay, now, if you've been in church for a long time, think about what the theologians who become so wise that they're fools argue about in that section. I'm getting in, you're not. That's what it is. Come up with all kinds of like different theologies and names, and I'm a this and I'm a that. I'm a Christian, right? So I'm not like, I don't know, some theological belief of a guy that, you know, lived a thousand or more years later. I'm a Christian. I follow Christ, not Calvin or somebody else. And you had to say it, right? Because the argument, I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not an Arminianism. I don't, whatever it is. They have these dumb arguments, quite frankly, in light of what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, I hope everybody gets in. While these theologians 
hearts of stone are saying, well, you know, that group's not getting in. They're not elect, you know, they're not predestined or anything like that. Did that person just miss the whole point of the letter? You can say yes. Yes, they did. The whole point of the letter is I hope everybody gets in. Stop arguing. Love, love, love. So here's what happens. It all builds up to chapter 12, and you get kind of a therefore in your version, right? So, okay, all this stuff, you guys need to get along, all this theology, blah, 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 blah. Okay, here's the point. So, therefore, and in Greek, it's parakalo, right? So, it's like, uh, please, it means please, literally, and thank you. But what he's saying is like, I, I'm pleading with you. So he starts. That's the first word right there, Romans 12.1. I'm begging you, basically, right? <laughs> Make yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age or this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Don't think like all these worldly people and the way you might have been. Think like Jesus, who is a sacrifice. Make yourself like that. That's worship. That's what I want from you. Be like a modern-day pastor saying, turn off the music and saying, stop it. Like, just love one another. That's it. That's worship. Just loving each other. That's it. That's all I want to hear from you. Enough. That's where Paul is, and that's how the letter turns. Romans 12, 3. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. A plea for unity. You're all part of the body. You're the same. You have differences. You have different functions, but you're all part of the same body. You're the body of Christ. So he talks about that and different gifts. People get lost in that too, miss the point. But if we continue, Romans 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Not the verse of the day. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you're honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but do evil. Or conquer evil by doing good. Sorry, bad slip. But conquer evil by doing good. Proverbs 25, he's quoting there. But do you get the point? Do good to those, right? So why? So if you keep reading the chapter 13, it'll sound exactly, exactly like 1 Peter chapter 2. Honor authorities. Oh, you're supposed to just honor them. Pay your taxes. Like, why are you guys worrying about these things in light of what Christ did for you? What? Do you, what? So gets into the next section. Loving your neighbor fulfills the law. This is how you fulfill the law. Love your neighbor. Stop with your theology. Not enough of it. Just, look, you want to fulfill all the stuff you're talking about? Turn to the person next to you. Just love that person no matter who they are, what religion they are, what color they are. It doesn't matter. Stop it. Just love everybody, even your enemies. Why? Well, Romans 13, 11. This is all the more urgent. For you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity or immoral living or in quarreling or jealousy. See how that's right there in with all the bad stuff? Right there, same level. Instead, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't let yourself think of ways to indulge your evil desires. Here's where last week and this week all come together. We are told how to fight the spiritual battle. Put away the sword. Put away the sword. 
Instead, what? Take up the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God, which commands us to do what? Love everybody. No exceptions, no buts. In this war, <laughs> it's not being fought with a physical sword. We're not just fighting for mere flesh and blood. We're fighting for souls. And there's only one way to win souls. It's not with violence or abusive words. It's with love. That's it. You've got to remember something. As I close, I just remember this. And we just miss this. Jesus loves me, this I know, right? But Jesus died for us. We sing, for God so loved the world, right? He died for me. And that's a correct statement, right? He died for me. But remember this. He also died for your enemy. And we forget that. He died for your enemy too. We must not work against the Lord's work by mistreating others. We must live sacrificially as he did. Jesus died for enemies. And just one thought, haven't you been the enemy? Because I'll tell you, every time we sin, we're the enemy. I've been the enemy. I'll just start with me. Right? My name is Gene, and I've been the enemy. I actually railed against Christianity. I spoke out against Jesus. I believed in other worldviews, a lot of different worldviews. I've been through a ton of them. And I would argue with Christians that Jesus wasn't real. That was my favorite one. That comes up all the time, which is why I'm very passionate when I start giving that whole speech. But anyway, you get my point. Like, I learned the truth by listening. That kind of, that thing. But here's the thing. Listening to who? I didn't listen to those who argued with me about it. I was wrong. But all the people that would fight with me, I'm like, I don't want to listen to you. So even knowing sometimes that I was wrong, I would just... Bleh, I say all kinds of crazy things just to win the argument or just argue with them. I was angry. It made me angry. That's what you do when you start fighting with people. You just kindle their anger. And you get nowhere. And so I didn't get anywhere. But you know when I finally got somewhere? Gracious, patient Christians. That's when I listened. Through all my faults, everything that I was knowingly doing wrong, trying to hide. They loved me. They were gracious with me. They were patient with me. They always told me the truth, even when it hurt, but they loved me, and I knew that, even though I was the enemy. And look at what God can do. He can take someone who was once the enemy, like a Paul, persecuting the church and turn that person into someone preaching the gospel. How? Love. 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 We are to extend the grace that we have been given. It's all about our passion for Jesus and our compassion for those for whom he died. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for everyone here as parts of the body of Christ. I pray that they know that you love them. And I pray that the gravity of that love may be felt so that it overflows onto everyone they encounter, that they see your face in the face of the enemy that it changes people radically. Use us as vehicles of your grace, your mercy, and your love. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.